Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Steve Stoliar, very funny comedy writer who was uh, Groucho Marx's, um, I guess he was his personal assistant or secretary, however you want to um, uh, call it, um, for the last few years that Groucho was alive, and he wrote a book about it called Raised Eyebrows, and I'm having him on the show today to talk about um, his experiences with Groucho, uh, writing comedy for Dick Cavett, and he later went on to do uh, comedy, he, he did um, screenplays for like uh, Simon and Simon, the short-lived karate show Sidekicks, uh, the new WKRP, and etc., and it's going to be great to have him on the show today. I am really excited about this interview. Uh, tomorrow, the whole fate of the world is at stake, and hopefully it will win in our favor tomorrow, November 3rd. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Steve Stoliar. Good afternoon, Steve. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I am okay. How are you? Uh, just anticipating, you know, the outcome of tomorrow's election. But other than that, I am spectacular. It may be that outcome and tomorrow's election are mutually exclusive terms. I don't know what we'll know at the end of tomorrow. Yeah, I have no idea, but uh, we could just hope for the best. I know. That's all we can do. Everybody's filled with anxiety. Yeah. Rightfully so. <laughs> Rightfully but so. That won't stop us from having a pleasant conversation. Absolutely. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> So, going back in time, uh, did you know early on that uh, you were funny? <laughs> it <laughs> remains to be seen. The jury <laughs> is still out. <laughs> uh, well, let me see. When I was really young, like maybe four or five, I used to lick a sliced lemon, and <laughs> it made me make a funny face and people laughed and even though I hated how sour the lemon was, I loved getting the laugh. So you see, with comedy there is great pain, even when you're four or five years old. I also found that I had a, a, a knack for imitating people that I came in contact with mm -hmm. and that people seemed to get a kick out of that. Uh, I also remember the first joke I ever thought of. This will tell you how long ago it was. Um, and again, remember that I was perhaps six. Uh, what does President Kennedy say to Jackie? What? You're my sugar. <laughs> You're my sugar. <laughs> yeah. I was picking up on his Boston accent and incorporating it with Yiddish, which, you know, it isn't bad for being six. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think I've always, <laughs> and, and I was class clown in my high school, which didn't mean biggest goof off. It meant sense of humor, which so I was flattered when I was voted class clown. And I was the one making snide remarks <clears throat> in the back of class. Yep, me uh, too. <laughs> I had a my favorite teacher in high school was Miss Harper who taught history and we stayed in touch for years after I graduated which was great because she could tell me all about uh, all of the stupid students she had and the different affairs that that uh, the faculty was having all these things she couldn't tell me at the time yeah. but she appreciated my sense of humor and didn't didn't try to stifle it and I remember one of the great things about her was that she didn't just tell us names and dates and battles and treaties. <coughs> she, she liked to talk about how human the people were that we were studying because it made it more interesting. Yeah. And she was talking about Ben Franklin, and she, she in, the, in the midst of the 
other biographical information she gave us, she said that he fathered 13 illegitimate children over his lifetime, and when he was 80 years old, he had a 16-year-old mistress, <laughs> which I piped in, well, he did invent the lightning rod. <laughs> now, it, it, it's not a bad line, even just between you and me on the phone, but in the pressurized atmosphere of an 11th grade history class, yeah. you can imagine what a thunderclap of laughter it got. But Miss Harper cracked up when she heard it. She didn't send me to the boy's vice principal. So <laughs> that is the uh, long answer to your short question. Now that's a teacher. <laughs> she was great. Oh, she God. told me once about a. She said she had one student who never participated. He sat in the back of class. He never raised his hand. He never wanted to be called on. And then one day she was teaching about uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and this kid raised his hand. He said, I know how President Roosevelt died. Mm -hmm. And she thought, well, we're not really talking about that, but if this is what will get you to participate. And she said, how did he die? And he said, he had cerebral hemorrhoids. And so he d and the whole class laughed at him, and he never said anything else the rest of the quarter. <laughs> That's awesome. Probably years of therapy as a result of of FDR's cere cerebral hemorrhoids. So. Therapy, welfare, the works. <laughs> uh -huh. Drug addiction. Yeah. Early death, all from cerebral hemorrhoids. <laughs> what comedians did you watch growing up? I was vaguely aware of Ernie Kovacs. I loved the Nairobi trio on the Kovacs show. I was vaguely aware of You Bet Your Life because of the duck dropping down from the ceiling that I thought was funny. But apart from that, I was, uh, I liked the, er, like Laurel and Hardy. I did, uh, really liked the Three Stooges when I was, you know, oh. six or seven. Same here. And as a matter of fact, uh, they came to St. Louis, which is where I spent my early childhood, uh, when they were promoting one of those features that they made in the early 60s. And I, I went down, I think it was a, in the parking lot of a supermarket. So they were playing, you know, prestigious places at that time. Mm. And I... I had no idea that the shorts that I was watching on TV were from the 1930s and 40s. So I couldn't believe how old these guys looked. Um, Mo and Larry with bags under their eyes and wrinkles and all this. And I didn't understand why Curly didn't look like the Curly in the movies. I didn't know he had been replaced by Joe DiRita. I just, again, I was just a kid. And Larry didn't have his hair frizzed out. He had it combed straight back against his head. And I remember at one point, Mo said, and this is Larry, he combs his hair with an egg beater. And people <laughs> laughed, but I thought, even at six, I thought, you know, the joke doesn't work, Mo, because Larry's hair isn't frizzed out, so the egg beater comparison isn't valid. Um, but nevertheless, it was galvanizing to be able to see them in person. And um, mm -hmm. uh, I guess I've had a fascination crossing paths with celebrity ever since then. And then we moved to California in 62 when I was rapidly <laughs> approaching eight years old. Yeah. And I had seen, like, on I Love Lucy, she would run into celebrities and get all excited and I thought is that really what it's like in California with celebrity and we ended up being seated behind Red Skelton on the airplane which and this was like at the height of his television fame his show was you know in the top 10 and he interacted with all of us during the whole flight back to from St. Louis to LA and a few seats ahead of him was Andy Griffith who also was at the height of his there must have been like a CBS affiliates meeting in St. Louis or something like that. <laughs> but I thought, wow, it really is like I Love Lucy. I'm, I'm only on the plane to California, and I've met two famous people. But it wasn't like that 
once we landed, but uh, we've always had a fascination with celebrities uh, in our family because we were from a place where there just weren't any. And so it was always exciting. I remember when mom would come back from shopping, she would say, I saw someone today. Someone meant someone, you know, whether it was Harold J. Stone or Simon Oakland or some character <laughs> actor. Yeah. It would always be exciting. And so I sort of grew up knowing there was a premium on on running into famous people. Yeah, for all the people out there listening who aren't familiar, Harold J. Stone was in a lot of Jerry Lewis movies. Oh, yeah, he was... I just saw him on a great Untouchables Yeah. the weekend that he was on. And actually, Elizabeth Montgomery and... David White were on, uh, and <laughs> Mary Elizabeth Tate. Montgomery was playing a scheming nightclub singer. This is a few years before she starred on Bewitched, yeah. and then David White played Darren's boss on Bewitched, but in this one, he's a sleazy lawyer who's on the make for Elizabeth Montgomery, so it was weird to watch him making out with Samantha. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, yes, uh, uh, character actors, I've always had a fascination with them. And very often you mention the name and people look blank and then they see them and you go, oh, oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah, oh, I love him. He's in, a, he's in all those old shows. So Yeah, Larry Tate uh, is what uh, David White played, yeah. Right. Yeah. Where, so, so where are you from originally? St. Louis. So you are from St. Louis, okay. And you, um, you moved out to L.A. in 62, you said? Yeah, our family moved out here because my dad's job, my dad worked for a company that was opening up a West Coast office, and they asked him if he wanted to run it, and he said yes, and so we made the big westward trek, which was kind of traumatic for my sisters because all of their friends were suddenly thousands of miles away. And I was very upset because the first place we lived out here was an apartment and they didn't accept pets. <laughs> so we weren't able to move our cat, Smokey, from St. Louis out here. And I remember standing on the front lawn just crying, thinking, you can't, we have to be able to bring our cat with us. Um, but, you know, the truth is it was, it was a big move for my dad and so much of what happened in my life after is a direct result of of being in L.A. rather than the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Was it a culture shock at all when you got there? Well, I don't know how much culture I understood when I was eight, but uh, I missed the snow because I was too young to drive in it or shovel it, so it was only something to play in and build snowmen and make snow angels and have snowball fights. And I miss, I really missed and still miss lightning bugs. Um, I lived in New York in the early 80s for a few years and they had lightning bugs there and it was so nice to see them again. Mm -hmm. um, and then I moved back to LA uh, for professional reasons. and had to go through lightning bug withdrawal again. But I really missed those from St. Louis. But I don't know how aware I was of, you know, the L.A. scene versus the St. Louis scene when you're that young. Um, but I certainly adopt, adapt, uh, adapted to it easily. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my ties weren't as strong as, as my sisters or my parents because... Uh, they had had decades to build relationships, and I was just a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how does uh, Groucho come into your life? Well, he, he seeped in through osmosis originally, I think. Uh, as I mentioned, I used to, I do remember the duck on You Bet Your Life. Right. Also, I had an Uncle Joe who was uh, balding with glasses, a mustache, smoked a cigar, and wiggled his eyebrows. Yeah. And so when I did discover Groucho proper, it was like, oh, he's, he's just like Uncle Joe. Um, and uh, my parents used to quote lines from 
Marx Brothers movies like you must have been vaccinated with a phonograph needle. <laughs> so sort of like the, the, the scene was set for me to be receptive to them. And it was, I think it was in very early high school that I finally saw one of their movies. I don't remember which one, but saw one of their movies from start to finish. <clears throat> and I thought, where have they been hiding all my life? And I know in two uh, consecutive lunch periods in high school, they showed a night at the opera in the auditorium. So we would get our food and go in and sit there and watch the first half and the next day the second half. Not an ideal way to see a movie, um, but I loved it. And I really became a fanatic for the March Brothers, as were all my friends, uh, since we were all of a similar personality and sense of humor. And Groucho was my favorite of the quartet or the trio, depending on your familiarity with the Marx Brothers, uh, because mm -hmm. of all of his wordplay and his, his thumbing his nose at authority and propriety and formality and being able to say and do things we wished we could without getting in trouble except in Miss Harper's class, because I could get away with it. But other than that, he said <laughs> the things you wished you could say, but you couldn't. And, um, you know, in the, the late 60s and early 70s, I think because the baby boomers were uh, anti-establishment, iconoclastic, you know, don't trust anyone over 30 generation, mm -hmm. they rediscovered the Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields and Mae West and those three groups. Uh, there was a big resurgence of interest in those classic comedy people, not so much some of the others. I mean, Abbott and Costello didn't really fit into that kind of <clears throat> uh, anti-establishment thing or Laurel and Hardy, but the Marx Brothers and Mae West and Fields experienced a renaissance then, and so their movies were more easily findable in revival houses, but mostly I had to just look through the TV guide and circle when something was on and then will myself to stay awake past Johnny Carson, past Tom Snyder's Today Show into the netherworld of local car commercials. and. And this is one at a time I was able to knock off a lot of classic films that they relegated to the early morning hours. But I felt a real connection to Groucho more than the other brothers, but I loved their movies. Yeah, I, I love their movies too. What, what's your favorite one? Uh, I'm very partial to the Paramount films because they were looser and sillier and pre-code and less stiff and less plot driven less plot driven is not a plus for a lot of movies but it is for them because you really want to see them go crazy you don't really want to see them vanquish the villain and knock themselves out to help the hero get together with the female lead um, so my favorite is Duck Soup but there's a that m magical trio of monkey business, horse feathers, and duck soup, <laughs> which only represent 31, 32, 33, that to me and <laughs> jurists represent the zenith of the Marx Brothers film comedy. Coconuts and Animal Crackers were just prior to those three. Those were based on stage plays, and those were filmed in New York on sound stages where they didn't have a boom microphone yet. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're play-like because they're based on plays and also because the actors couldn't move around much or you would miss out on some of their dialogue. But once they came to Hollywood, starting with monkey business, when you had a boom microphone that could follow them all over the place, it was like they were shot out of a cannon and those three movies I mentioned really, I think, were the zenith of their funniness. A lot of people prefer Night at the Opera and Day at the Races, which were their first movies when they left Paramount and went to MGM in the mid-30s. Right. And those, those are 
certainly higher quality production wise because MGM was just the Rolls Royce of studios, but they they were sort of tamer when they went to MGM. Um, the head of production was Irving Thalberg, mm-hmm. and he said to the Marx Brothers, "I could make a picture with you guys." that would have half as many laughs and make twice as much money. And he was right, because those were their two biggest money-making films. Um, but now, from from a, you know, a distance of 80-something years, the, the Marx purists kind of regret the decision to go with MGM, where their craziness was was diluted a little bit in favor of making for a better balanced movie with love songs and villains and extended. Yeah. I, I, plot. Yeah. I, I like that. That's a sharp drop after that. I mean, there's people <laughs> who love all their movies and I think there's something to be found in all of them. But those of us who are real March brothers fans, uh, after night at the opera, even between night at the opera and day at the races, something some energy is lost and then when you get yeah. into at the circus and go west and the big store they're really they're, they're they're not particularly it seemed like a lot of different comedians or comedy teams could have done those kind of movies as more slapstick and less clever and heavier plots and it's just not as fun as the craziness at Paramount. Yeah, I, I like Duck Soup. I like Horse Feathers. You know, Groucho is the quarterback on the football team. He looks at the center's ass and says, "Fancy meeting you here." <laughs> you know. Uh huh. Um, yeah. I, I yeah I do agree. When they went to MGM and did the Night at the Opera and Day at the Races, the energy was different. But Groucho was hilarious just as much in those ones as he was in the earlier films. Um, I also think too. Uh, Irving Thalberg's death maybe had something to do with it too. Yeah. They didn't have a. He cared. He cared about <laughs> them, and Louis Mayer didn't really care for them. Yeah. Uh, he thought that they were kind of vulgar, <laughs> and he liked wholesome stuff like the Andy Hardy movies, and movies based on popular literature or classic literature, Dickens, so that sort of thing. And he just sort of found it just a little ill-mannered, you know. But Thalberg liked them, but then he died, you know, at like 38 years old or something. Yeah. 36, during the production of, of Day at the Races. And uh, it hit a lot of the MGM stars really hard because he wasn't a typical studio head. He was someone that cared about stories and connected personally with the people that he signed so they really lost an ally you're right it was that that's one of the reasons that, but also audiences changed yeah uh and they were looking for something else and it's easy for us to retroactively judge them wrong and say they, they shouldn't have flocked to that movie they should have more of them should have gone to see duck soup but you know that's when Abbott and Costello in the late 30s and early 40s, that's when they became the kings of comedy, and their stuff holds up fairly well, and as, you know, I, I enjoy them, but not the same way I do the Marx Brothers, but that's, I mean, audiences in the early 40s couldn't get enough of Abbott and Costello, and they just cranked out movie after movie at Universal several a year. Um, so audiences' tastes changed as well. It wasn't just uh, the studios deciding to sabotage the Marx Brothers' craziness. They were they needed to give the audiences what they wanted, or they wouldn't make money. So it is that uneasy alliance between art and commerce. Yeah, I mean Laurel and Hardy. Um, you know, uh, I, Chaplin. He was he you know, he was transitioning into doing more serious stuff at that time. Yeah, comedy was changing yeah. by that point, and stuff. I remember too, uh, Groucho when he was on Cavett, he'd say that uh, Thalberg was very eccentric. He would barricade his windows so he didn't hear the waves on the beach. <laughs> yeah, he bought a he had a house built in Malibu, and then had it uh, soundproof so he wouldn't have to hear 
the sound of the waves crashing, which of course would have been one of the big selling points to anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> that was him, and he he had a great eye for quality. And uh, even though his he didn't tend to put his name on his mo- on the movies he produced, hmm. but uh, they they really were of a higher quality than a lot of other producers whose names were all over them. Yeah. And we'll never know what he would have accomplished if he if he'd uh, not died young. Oh yeah, he could have been on the same list as you know uh, David O. Selznick and and all those producers that from that time, you know. Yeah, and into the forties and fifties. Yeah. Even so well. Yeah. Sure. But 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 Groucho, I mean that guy. I mean he had balls to say whatever the hell he wanted in a very conservative time in our history. And like, you look at these quotes today, they hold up. And I think that if he were alive today, he would be under fire with the woke culture. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, the, the only thing that gets me more upset than political rec- uh, correctness is retroactive political correctness, which is sort of what leads to banishing uh, Charlie Chan films and Amos and Andy and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. And you get you get that in, you know, there were so many cultural stereotypes that were just part of theater and film. It's completely unfair to go back at something that came out in 1931 and say, why didn't the audiences realize that 85 years later people are going to be offended by that? And, you know, when sometimes you bet your life is syndicated and you catch the reruns <laughs> and people complain and say, Groucho treated those women as sex objects. He wiggled his eyebrows at them and he would have women with big boobs and tight sweaters and he would he would make comments about them. And that's so demeaning. And he's just, you know, relegating them to just sex objects. And I I have just no patience for that kind of. You know, let's let's uh, judge them on 21st century values and styles, and then and uh, treat them harshly. You know, blackface. There's, if you get rid of all the people who appeared in blackface, you've gotten rid of Fred Astaire and Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney and W. C. Fields and Laurel and Har. I mean, it's endless. So. Nobody understands historical context anymore. They're just their their knee jerk reaction is this must not be shown. Uh, you should not find this entertaining. You should be offended. Ugh. And yeah, I think Groucho would have a tough time now. Although he wasn't a fan of dirty comedians, he yeah. you know he thought that a dirty laugh was an easy laugh that anyone. Right could say a four-letter word or talk about something sexual or, or bathroom stuff and get a laugh, but that that was sort of cheating because it wasn't clever or creative. Now, personally, he could say off-color stuff, you know, in his home, but he took a dim view of people who did it professionally. So that wouldn't have been a restriction for him. But a lot of his other comments now would look... I mean, for heaven's sakes, he was born in 1890. He was literally Victorian, because Victoria was on the throne of England until 1901. Yeah. So even though he wasn't British, he was born in Victorian times. I asked him once how far back he could remember, and he said, I guess the Spanish-American War which was in 1898. And you may, you may or may not know that the, that the Marx Brothers started out <clears throat> singing and only later put comedy into their stage shows. Right. But uh, Groucho appeared as a solo singer at the Metropolitan Opera House um, at a special program that was to raise money for victims of the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. Mm-hmm. So he was this living connection, someone who remembered before the Wright brothers and also the moon landings, which is just a huge chunk of history. Um, so I bristle when people take someone who was born 
born in 1890 and say he should have been more thoughtful, he should have been more sensitive. And also, for heaven's sakes, his name was Groucho. It wasn't Warmo or Cordulo or Thoughtfulo, and it sprang from the fact that he, you know, he had that kind of sharp tongue. It wasn't overtly insulting the way Rickles would do, but... Uh, you know, that was his personality. He made no apologies for it. And uh, yeah. as I say, it, it bugs me when people trot out something from the 20s or 30s and say, look how terrible this person was for having said that. Um, anyway, I'll hop down off my soapbox now and answer your question. <laughs> I, know I did stand up for 10 years, and I pretty much got out of it because of what we've been going through the last few years. I just, I just yeah, don't want to... Wanna... Say yeah. he can't play colleges anymore because he'll say something and he'll hear hissing or a sharp intake of breath like, ooh, I can't believe he said that, or um, people murmuring or walking out or something, and it's terribly restrictive. I'm, you know, I've done, I did a few uh, Gilbert Gottfried podcasts, and Gilbert and yep. I get along great, yeah. and I think it's wonderful that he's still able to be who he is without having to conform or suffer the wrath yep. of self-righteous censor. I'm, you know, I tell people I'm offended by people who are offended. Me too. <laughs> it, it gets to that point. So I'm sorry that you ran into that with your stand-up stuff, but I could see that. And I know a lot of comics said they, they just can't deal with college crowds because they're all into the whole PC, Me Too, everything, everybody needs to be treated with respect and and you should you may need to be careful of other people's feelings and if one person finds it objectionable, you know you need to change it and that you know, you can't you you shouldn't do that with comedy, but we're dealing with a, a period where there's no gray areas. There's just Either you do acceptable stuff or you're yanked before a tribunal and made to answer for your trespasses and beg forgiveness and say, I'll never do it again. And that's a, I don't think comedy thrives in that kind of an airless vacuum. Yeah, and I have no respect for the people who apologize. <laughs> you know, it's just... Yeah, I always, I, 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 someone will say something and they'll be attacked and I'll think, too bad, too bad, and then the person will apologize, and I'll think, oh, I wish you hadn't done that, because, yeah, I lose respect for, what was it, Jimmy Kimmel had done a blackface thing probably years ago or something? Yeah. He had to apologize for it in 2020, because it's, it's considered reprehensible now. Yeah. yeah, I was watching TCM, and they have a a little featurette on the history of blackface, and they were showing a clip of Fred Astaire from Swing Time, which is probably one of his top three films. Yeah. In it, he, he salutes Bill Bojangles Robinson and is in blackface and emulating some of Robinson's moves. And the narration on this little featurette is, of course we're horrified by what we see. And I thought... <laughs> No, not of course, and I'm not horrified. I'm entranced by his dancing, and don't think that he is making fun of or demeaning black people. Um, he thought that the Nicholas brothers were the greatest dancers on film, and he was a friend of Bojan. Anyway, it's endless, but you and I mm -hmm. are on the same wavelength about this, even if other people get all huffy and indignant. Exactly. One of, one of my favorite quotes Groucho ever had, uh, I, I know you've seen this, everyone has, um, on you on you bet your life, uh, he's talking to a man who had 17 children. Do you remember this? Oh, you want to know the story behind that? Yes. Yeah. This is one of those, this is a real, uh, there's no quick way to do it, but it's an interesting story, so I'll bore you with it. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> this is a story that has been told and retold over the years mm -hmm. and seems to be mired in groups of people who say he never said it and groups of people who say he did say it, I remember seeing it on TV. And in that case, they're both wrong. Mm -hmm. um, what happened was 
there was a family from Bakersfield. The last name was Story, S-T-O-R-Y. Right. And they did have like 15 children. And Groucho asked Mrs. Story, why do you have so many children? And she said, well, I believe that that's God's purpose for us here on earth to have children. And I love my husband. And Groucho said, well, I love my cigar, too, but I take it out of my mouth from time to time. (laughs) Now, that was said when the show was only on radio, was not on television yet, and it was edited out before it aired because it was considered way too risque for late 40s audiences. So the only people who really heard that were the ones in the studio audience that day because it hit the cutting room floor. But the story got around and people repeated it and it's been told. And so now you have all sorts of people who say, oh no, I've seen it. And my only response is either they're lying or mm-hmm. they have come to believe they've seen it because they've heard it so often. Mm-hmm. But they could not have seen it because it was the radio show, and they could not have heard it because it was edited out. But it is also wrong to say that it's apocryphal, that he never said it, and it never happened. Because um, when I was working for Groucho, I helped out on a book about behind the scenes of You Bet Your Life, and most of the staff was still around. And the head writer, Bernie <laughs> Smith, mm-hmm. uh, he, he kept a chart of every episode, the contestants, how much they won, and what the secret word was. I don't, he said he, he doesn't know why he did it, but he started it and then figured he had to keep up with it. So for the entire 12-year run of the show, he would carefully log, and he showed where the Mr. and Mrs. Story were on in the 47, 48, like first season of the radio thing. And he vividly remembered the circumstances of it. So there are still people today who say that never happened, that was just made up. And there are still people who say, I saw it. And they're both wrong, but he did say it. There's a similar phenomenon with um, with the Dick Cavett show. He had the, the founder of Prevention Magazine, uh, Dr. Rodale, on oh, the yeah. show, who was a health expert. <laughs> I know that story. Yeah. And Rodale said, I'm going to live to be 100. And <laughs> those were his last words. Shortly after that, he had a heart attack and died in front of the studio audience. Yeah. And Cavett said, <laughs> what happened was, they, after he said, I'll live to be 100, they went to commercial and they came back, and he had moved down the couch, and they brought out the next guest who was talking, and then he heard Dr. Rodale snort and his head nodded forward onto his chest. And at first he thought Rodale was being funny, like, oh, this guy's so boring, I'm falling asleep. And then he said there was a certain stillness to him <laughs> that you, you never mistake for sleep. And he realized, and Cabot said he knew if he said, is there a doctor in the house, it would have gotten a laugh. So he said, is there a doctor present in the theater? And there was. And they stopped taping. And, and in fact, Dr. Rodale had died. Now, all sorts of people say, I'll never forget, I was watching that night and I couldn't believe it. Well, they, they didn't air it that night. It wasn't a live show. They ran a rerun that night. And yeah. ABC would never have the poor taste to show one of his one of Dick Cavett's guests having a heart attack and dying on television. Of course. It is a true story, and but it's been told a lot. But people who say, I, I was watching that night, again, are either lying or they've come to believe they've seen it because it's been repeated. It's an interesting psychological phenomenon. I hope everyone's taking notes. It is, it is yeah. <laughs> That's one of the classic moments. Uh, Cavett had so many great moments. Do you know which one I saw recently on YouTube that I heard about for years and I never right. saw it? Was when um, Chad Everett was making those sexist comments and Lily Tomlin stormed out of there. Yes. Yes. I could not believe, oh my God. I, I don't even think it was 
that bad even for the seventies. What he was saying, you know, it was just stupid. He was just trying to make a joke, you know, and it, yeah. it didn't. It wasn't that she funny. She was a feminist before it was. Yeah. All that common, and obviously ultra sensitive, and so she had, you know, she reserved the right to do that. Lester Maddox. Oh yeah. Walked off a Cabot show because Cabot was talking about. Um, he said something like. Um, and you, what do you say to those racist supporters of yours who, you know, well, Mr. Campbell, my, my constituents aren't racist, they're not, and I find that offensive, and then, he, and then and he reworded it and said something like, well, of those supporters of yours who do happen to be racist, and Maddox just got up and walked out, and... Mm-hmm left the show, uh, which they did leave in, and it's a wonderful moment of reality. Um, yeah, he had a great show, and, and he got a lot of people that other hosts weren't able to get <clears throat> because uh, it's like authors like to go on his show because he actually read their books. He didn't just look at a cover page of a synopsis or suggested questions. And he had such a rich basis to draw on for his own experiences and opinions that it, it really was more of a conversation than just, you know, what was your favorite this or what was it like working with this? It, it was a shared experience. And in fact, Jack Parr, who was one of the early hosts of The Tonight Show and Cabot was a writer for him, when Cabot was about to start his own talk show, Jack Parr said, here's my advice, don't interview anyone. And Cabot said, what are you talking about? It's an interview show. <laughs> and Parr said, don't interview them, have a conversation with them. And a lot of people didn't like that and thought, I don't wanna hear what the host has to say. Yeah. <laughs> and it was often the case that I didn't, it's like I didn't care what Mike Douglas had to say. And for the most part, I didn't care what Merv Griffin wanted to add. But in Cavett's case, it enriched, it was the, you know, the, the whole was greater than the sum of its parts. And you did have these wonderful back and forth conversations um, that made it that made it a special kind of show that other people, you know, and plus that he had the clout to do 90 minutes with one guest instead of having to say, excuse me, but Zsa, Zsa Gabor is coming out to talk about a new perfume or something like that. Um, yeah, and I'm so glad we have so many of them uh, that Cabot was able to stop ABC before they had completely taped over all of them with Let's Make a Deal with Monty Hall, which is what they had started doing. <laughs> the summer lost forever, and oh, he had to yeah. pay to keep the ones safe that they didn't destroy, so it was worth their their while to not destroy them. but. They were in the process of being covered over with, do you want what Jay is bringing down the aisle or what's door number two? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're working uh, with Groucho, you know, it's during the most tragic and mind-boggling era of, of his life, you know, uh, with that whole Aaron Fleming thing, you know. I mean, did, did you sense an, in, an, an uneasy energy from her from the get-go? Um, well, I suppose for those who aren't familiar with how I got together with Groucho, which would probably be, oh, say, almost everyone in your listening crowd, um, I had started a committee at UCLA to put pressure on Universal to re-release Animal Crackers, which was caught up in legal problems. Right. And that got me in touch with Aaron Fleming, who was the youngish actress and Groucho's manager, who had gradually taken over control of his professional and personal life. <clears throat> and that's how I got to meet Groucho. I said, Groucho, I'm very happy to be meeting you after all these years. And he said, well, you should be. And, uh, and Aaron said, this is Steve Stolier. He's the one trying to get Animal Crackers re-released. And Groucho said, well, did you get it? And I said, I, uh, not yet, but, uh, but uh, we're working on it. And he said, well, you better or I'll fire you. And I said, I didn't realize I was even working for you. What are you paying me? And he said, a little less than nothing. And that was our first conversation. And then the movie came out 
Mm -hmm. uh, Universal relented and cleared the rights, and it broke the box office record of the UA Westwood that had been set by the French Connection several years earlier. And I was rewarded with this plum job of working at Groucho's house, handling fan mail and letters he was sending out, and also organizing all of his memorabilia, scrapbooks and photos and scripts and letters, and just, it was such a rich treasure trove of stuff, uh, which would be donated to the Smithsonian after he died. And I, I wasn't treated as the help. I was able to have lunch at the, at the table with whoever might be coming over for lunch, or even if it was no one, I could talk to Groucho about whatever I wanted. Yeah. And it was just, it was literally a dream come true because I used to dream about meeting Groucho and they'd be really vivid dreams. And then I would wake up and as the dream would dissolve, I'd think, damn it, it was so real. I, eh. So when I finally got to meet him, it really was a dream come true. And then to be paid money to go to his house every day and sit in a room that I had to myself and, and quote, work, yeah. interacting with Groucho and all those people. Um, I saw early on that Aaron was a little eccentric. For instance, she showed up at UCLA uh, on one of the days we were doing the petition drive for Animal Crackers, wearing a full-length mink coat when everyone else was in T-shirts and jeans and kids. And, um, it seemed odd also because it was a kind of a warm day, but she showed up in a full-length but I still didn't suspect that there was anything nefarious about her. And as a matter of fact, during, before I got the job, during the whole campaign, she took to calling me at all hours of the day or night and just kind of venting. And at the time, I remember feeling really flattered because I knew who she was because I was such a Groucho fan. I, I mean, she, she and Groucho were on the cover of an Esquire magazine that had an article about, you know, Groucho and his young secretary and all this. And the idea that she was selecting me to call at one in the morning and just rattle off whatever was on her mind, I thought, wow, that I'm so special. <laughs> um, and it was only when I got to working at the house and watching how she behaved that I realized that she had a really volatile, mercurial personality. She was given to screaming fits and slamming doors and yelling at people, and, uh, and then was kind of paranoid because she would see enemies where there weren't any. Uh, there would be some innocent thing, and she would blow it way out of proportion. And then there'd be something that we thought, oh God, when Aaron hears about this, she's gonna hit the ceiling. And she would laugh it off. So she was really unpredictable and moody. And unfortunately, sometimes Groucho was the target of her anger, or I think part of it was her refusal to come to grips with the fact that he was human and old and had had health problems like, you know, his arteries and a stroke and slowing down. And I think she felt like if she could <clears throat> yell and somehow shake the rust off of his brain, he could go back to being his younger self. But he was, you know, just this guy from 1890 in his mid-80s with health problems, and I think that frustrated her. But this would cause Groucho's blood pressure to go up dangerously high because there was always a nurse around. They were always young, attractive females, so the Groucho had that kind of companion, arm, arm candy companionship. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, they had his best interests at heart, and Aaron was very ambitious and wanted to use Groucho to further her own career, and it was really at the expense of his health to a large degree. And it was very difficult to stay on her good side, assuming she had one. Yeah. I was, you know, 19 or 20, and I had not grown up in, you know, there was, in my 
in our household, there was never any yelling or slamming of doors or throwing of dishes or screaming or it was a very kind of even keeled sedate middle of the road atmosphere mm-hmm. and it was really jarring for me to be exposed to this kind of raw emotion um, and behavior but somehow I managed to stay on her good side uh, and was the longest surviving employee except for Arturo the gardener who was literally and figuratively on the outside looking in so he wasn't really pulled into the intrigue inside the house but it was very difficult because those of us I mean most of us cared a lot about Groucho and wanted to do what we could as a buffer really although he you know he was kind of infatuated with Aaron and had grown very dependent on her as he got weaker and hazier so it was a very difficult needle to thread because we also worried that if we were somehow able to remove Aaron from the scene it might be better for Groucho but is it like taking away a a drug addict syringe and saying deal with it because he was so dependent on her we didn't know what removing her would do to him either Mm -hmm. so it was and his children weren't of much help. Uh, His youngest daughter, Melinda, had turned her back on Hollywood and moved to Mendocino, Northern California. His older daughter, Miriam, was kind of in and out of psych units and alcohol rehab centers. She had a very troubled life. And then Groucho's son, Arthur, who was a successful writer, um, he, he had, God, he had just a shrew of a wife, Lois, who was sort of a miniature version of Aaron that bossed him around. and was. Um, th- they didn't really want to be responsible for Groucho, um, you know, on a daily basis. And according to Aaron, if Arthur were in charge of Groucho's life, he'd put him in uh, a, a home. And Groucho didn't want that. He wanted to stay in his own house. We never did find out if that was true because so much of what Aaron said was either exaggeration or complete fabrication. Mm -hmm. But we didn't see much of Arthur, so we didn't really get much of the other side. So it was a very, you know, as I say, the truth is gray, rarely black or white. Um, Aaron did keep him going and bring his spirits up and help keep the spotlight focused on him during that renaissance of interest in the Marx Brothers. She didn't create it, but she certainly helped him ride that wave. Um, But his last few years were rugged ones because of her volatility. And in fact, she was later diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. So you're dealing with a crazy woman in charge of the life of a frail legend. And that's, you know, it's nitro and glycerin with me in between. So I did a lot of growing up then. Um, (laughs) And, you know, in addition to her dealing with Aaron, the other dark element was getting close to my hero and watching him slowly fade out, which was rough. But the the trade-off is how spectacular the three-year experience was for me. I mean, it was life-changing, and the good far outweighed the bad. It's sort of like whatever Dorothy says at the end of The Wizard of Oz. Some of it was scary, but most of it was wonderful. And that was sort of, you know, when I my first day on the job, I opened the door into the house, and it felt like it went into Technicolor, like when Dorothy landed in Oz. And the people I was able to meet, you know, um, Bob Hope and and George Burns and Steve Allen and Jack Lemmon and S.J. Perelman and Mae West and Groucho's writers, you know, Maury Riskin and Nat Perrin and Irving Brecker and you know, just all those people from his world or, and, and whose names I knew from the Groucho letters or watching them roll by at the end of the movies and George Fenneman, the announcer on You Bet Your Life mm-hmm. and, and Zippo and Gummo, the two brothers who were still alive. Chico and Harpo had died in the early 60s, but I got to know 
Zeppo and Gummo, the straight men, and and uh, I'm able to say that Zeppo and I dated the same girl. Uh, she was 19, I was 20, and he was 74. So <laughs> I don't know how many people could make that claim or would want to make that claim, but uh, I really liked Zeppo, and as is often said, he really did have quite a personality and was funny and charming, and you didn't get to see it in those early films. He left the act after Duck Soup and became an extremely um, successful agent, representing Clark Gable and Carol Lombard and Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Taylor and Lucille Ball and Lana Turner. He did really well as an agent and never looked back. He was never comfortable performing, but in person he was uh, quite a character. Wow. Yeah, I remember seeing his daughter interviewed on a HBO documentary. She looked like she had a pretty hard life and well, all of that. His daughter Miriam? Yeah, Miriam. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she she ultimately she was able to pull up from the nosedive before she slammed into the ground and she sobered up. <laughs> And her last years were, uh, not last years, I mean, last decades were uh, fairly tranquil ones. As a matter of fact, I saw Arthur Marks at Universal in the early 80s, mm -hmm. and we caught up, and I, I said, how's Miriam? And he said, uh, uh, she's doing really well now. She stopped drinking, I guess. Uh, she didn't have a reason to after our father died. Interesting insight there. That is very apparently, interesting. chronologically, that was when she started shaping up, was after he was gone. Although, I have heard it said that of Groucho's three children, Miriam was the one that inherited his brilliance and wit, and it's too bad that she had such a rough life. Arthur was successful, but I think most people consider his work to be workmanlike, you know, not bad, but not exceptional. He, he wrote plays and wrote sitcoms and was successful, but there wasn't a spark of genius to him. And Melinda's very nice, um, but never really went in for showbiz, except when Groucho would trot her out once a season to do a, a duet on You Bet Your Life. But Miriam apparently had the intellect, and uh, we'll never know what she might have achieved if she didn't have those demons. Yeah. Um, you know, it's... Uh, he, I think Groucho envied Harpo because he was... He, he got married in 36 and stayed married to the same woman for the rest of his life till he died in 64. They adopted a number of children and uh, apparently was just the sweetest man and had a great marriage. Mm -hmm. And Groucho had three divorces. He said, uh, I married my wives for their beauty. None of them had anything upstairs except another man from time to time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, you know, he sort of asked for it. As he got older, his wives got younger. They were all very attractive, but... He didn't see them as someone to, as, as partners, uh, you know, he wanted to, he was, you know, from an older age where the men sat around with cigars after the meal and talked about politics and business and that sort of thing. And the women were domestic and cooking and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I think his wives didn't realize what they were getting into, or maybe they did, but regretted it, I don't know, but uh, when you, you know, they should have known to some degree what marrying Groucho Marx might be like. Yeah. And I don't know to what degree Groucho thought he would be able to hold on to increasingly younger wives. Um, they ended up having drinking problems. Although I, I bristle at the idea that Groucho, quote, drove them to drink because yeah. it's more complicated than that. And certainly in the case of his second wife, Kay, she had been married once before to Leo Gorsi of the Dead End East Side Bowery Boys kids movies. And they apparently used to get liquored up all the time and beat the shit out of each other and 
throw <laughs> bottles at each other. So she she was a raging alcoholic before Groucho married her, um, but she was young and attractive and willing, and uh, she ended up being Melinda's mother. But they got divorced. That that marriage didn't last very long. Um, so when people say, you know, oh, these poor young ladies, they married him and then he drove them to drink, that's, it, it's very simplistic and it's more complex than that. But I would say that he was probably a handful yeah. as a husband. Um, but, you know, that people aren't one-dimensional. Yeah, I had heard all that stuff about him, the way he treated women and stuff. So, yeah, he kind of did get his just desserts with Aaron. You know, it's, it seems like she was just like a, a hanger-on type with no talent, like a uh, like a Charles Manson family uh, type of girl, just, you know, from that generation, just mean and cruel, you know? She was mean and cruel except when she wasn't, when she could be sweet and gracious and helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, that was That was the pisser. Was you could you can't just say she was Cruella Deville and just made Grouch's life a living hell and every day was horrible because it wasn't and as I say there was no one else willing to devote themselves to him from his family so she happened to come along at a kind of an opportune time when he he was semi retired and living alone in, in his Beverly Hills home. And she picked him up and dusted him off and put him back in the spotlight. Um, but the, his longtime friends resented her for that because they didn't think he was in any condition to be out doing the one-man shows and TV appearances and stuff. But he thrived on audiences. So, again, it's a very complicated equation. I, don't, I mean, he didn't want to die in obscurity or just getting letters and articles written about him during the baby boomer renaissance of the Marx Brothers. Um, so, you know, she helped him go out a living legend, but made it a very rugged road for him. But she also, I mean, I'll always owe her that I got the job because she was the one I talked to to see if there was anything she could think of that I might be helpful with. And apparently my timing was just right because she used to be a secretary and she said, we need someone who really knows their Marx Brothers to handle all of this. And I thought, oh, please, 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 please. So, you know, I have a lot of positive memories of her, um, but then she could just flip like a light switch from charming and laughing to, you know, and sometimes you weren't sure if she was kidding because since she was an actress, she could also put on that she was in a certain mood just to get a certain reaction or it was it was rough stuff and especially as i say for a 20 year old kid who had never dealt with anyone that had like substance abuse or psychological problems or was given to screaming and throwing things Mm -hmm. i did a lot of growing up but man what an experience and it certainly I, you know, I, as I as I said, I was always interested in old movies and and comedians and that sort of thing. But I didn't really take it seriously as something that I could do for a living. So I was initially a history major at UCLA. Although how I, how I was going to make a living as a history major was something that puzzled my dad and me. Um, but I, I so thrived on the atmosphere in there. In particular, Groucho and his circle. Aaron had some quirky friends like Bud Court and Sally Kellerman and Elliot Gould. Um, I think also there was a lot of recreational drug use at the time. So Mm -hmm. my view of them was altered to that degree as well. I didn't indulge, but I think they did. But I instantly was drawn into Groucho's old writers and and Groucho preferred the company of writers. Even at, at uh, MGM, he preferred sitting at the writer's table because writers were well-read and opinionated and informed and stimulating conversationalists. And Groucho generally thought of actors as kind of self-involved, empty vessels. 
Yeah. So it, it would have meant nothing to him to sit at the table with Clark Gable and Joan Crawford and Robert Taylor and the big stars at MGM. He would much prefer to hang out with the guys and uh, talk about politics and uh, showbiz rumors and stuff. And uh, he was always, you know, he didn't have an education beyond grade school, but he was always overcompensating for it. He was a voracious reader, had a great vocabulary, and wrote several books. So Grouch, and, and he was really proud of those. And when, when the Library of Congress asked to have the originals of his letters, um, he felt so validated. I mean, he would, he would go on Cabot's show and say, I got a letter from the Library of Congress. They want my letter. And it, it sort of gets a ripple of laughter because you're used to him saying things intended to get a laugh. And he looks a little hurt and says, no, I mean, they really want them. All these famous people wrote to me and they want to have those there. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I got into writing, uh, also after meeting S.J. Perelman at his house and talking about that. And yeah. Perelman, in addition to working on some of the Paramount Marx films, filled about 20 books of short, humorous stories that were originally in The New Yorker. Um, I mean, he was one of the 20th century's top humorists, and would he would bristle when all people wanted to talk about was what was it like writing for the Marx Brothers because he was a lot more than just a gag man. But he talked to me and he advised me to write plays because the writer has more control over it that in TV you get producers imposing and, and sponsors imposing what they want and in film you have the director imposing his personality but the stage is freer for the writer. Um, I have yet to write a play, but I've at least yeah. <laughs> television shows that I wrote, and I should probably mention at some point, like now, that I wrote yeah. a book called Raised Eyebrows, My Years yeah. Inside Groucho's House, which can be found on Amazon and Kindle and the audiobook with me doing all the voices, or if someone wants to get a copy of the book book, uh, personalized or just signed by me, they can go to my website which is Steve Stolier, S-T-O-L-I-A-R dot com. And I'm happy to say that the book is currently being developed into a motion picture, which is yes. moving along mm. steadily. And I can't talk too much about it at this point, but it's been an interesting ride and uh, the elements are starting to come together. And it's going to be very strange seeing someone playing me at 20 years old up on the screen with my <laughs> with my Chad Everett mutton chop <laughs> and long hair and mustache but uh, I, I look forward to that and uh, yeah, very, I, again very gratifying that some book that I wrote setting down my experiences at Groucho's house that people were able to see really the dramatic potential because it's essentially the story of this aging Hollywood legend and this young, ambitious, volatile woman and then this naive fan kid that gets dropped into this Petri dish of best of times, worst of times. So, yeah, I remember, there you have it. Yeah, I remember a year ago Rob Zombie was on Joe Rogan and he talked about um, the movie. Yeah, he was attached to it and he's a great guy and we're still buds um and and the pisser was that we just ran into a wall in terms of funding because people were hung up on his background as a horror guy and i had even written an op-ed for the hollywood reporter about all of the mainstream directors who started out in horror and then left it and i even mentioned robert wise Yep. started out directing Curse of the Cat People and wound up with West Side Story and Sound of Music. So you shouldn't judge people only by what they've done. But unfortunately, that's what we ran into. So there is a, another director attached who's a mainstream director. I can't talk about it yet because it hasn't been officially announced. Right. But that does seem to be opening some of the doors that had been a little stubborn because of Rob's persona. 
Arizona, which is too bad because he loved the story and loved the book and was, you know, he wasn't interested in turning it into something cheap and tawdry, but I, you know, I just have learned to stay loose and pliable because there's so many ups and downs in trying to get a movie made, but it's been good for now. It is. It's insane. Um, Do do you have any uh, quick stories about uh, writing for like Simon Simon and Sidekicks and WKRP? Um, uh, Simon and Simon and Sidekicks. Boy, Sidekicks. Um, I'll tell you what was interesting was uh, um, Simon and Simon. I I learned that, you know, the egos of the people on the show can impact how rewrites go. Yeah. What you turn in as a freelance writer is then uh, redone by the staff, but also there are certain things that actors don't want to do. And so there were certain things I had put in there that, that Gerald McCraney didn't want to do and I had to get redone. Also, I did a few episodes of the sci-fi series Sliders. And again, in television, the content and tone is dictated by the people who run the show. And what they were looking for on Sliders tended to vary from season to season in terms of the kinds of stories they wanted to do. And I remember... (laughs) I I did three episodes of it, and they were shooting one of them when one of the regulars, John Reese Davis. Oh, yeah. He's the heavy set bearded guy in the Indiana Jones movies. Yeah, he looks like Pavarotti. That show. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, the interviewer, I think it's still on the internet, which is, you know, one of the wonderful wonders of modern technology. The interviewer said something like, Uh, what will you be doing next? And he said, I'd like to shoot Steve Stolier. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm, you Google your name and you don't know what mine you're going to step on in doing that. And And the reason was he didn't like the story of the script I had written for that season, although it was exactly what the producers asked me to write. And it's like, he should have known that I didn't just come in with a crazy idea and force it on them because you go in and you pitch a number of different ideas and if one of them sparks and then it goes through the staff mm. to turn it into something that is even closer to what they're looking for but they happen to catch him on a day when his dream was to murder me so uh, it's not for the squeamish yeah <laughs> yeah I can imagine so do you have any um any projects you're working on uh, during COVID? Actually, I'm in the midst of something that's really gratifying, and I've shared some of it with some people who aren't connected to my family or me, and they agree that there's something there. My father uh, wrote letters to my mother during World War II, and they had vowed to write every day, and they came damn close. And he, these were saved over the years. And my sisters and I finally sat down to read through them. And it's a remarkable archive of what it was like for a GI in North Africa and Germany and France and Italy in 44 and 45. Um, I mean, everything from how how the Allies are doing and rumor, here, listening to Nazi propaganda broadcasts about how terribly the Allies are doing. And then little moments like uh, movie reviews, because he and Mom used to love to go to the movies, and they were still comparing notes because Dad would see something like Laura or a guy named Joe or to have and have not. He saw to have and have not and said, bogey is good as usual, but... Uh, I don't think we're going to be hearing much from the woman. I don't like her voice. And that was his pronouncement on Lauren Bacall in her film debut. Yeah. Plus all the references to current popular songs and all the pangs of, of yearning to go back home. And he had a 
young daughter, my older sister, Carol, and uh, he was trying to raise her from 5,000 miles away. So I'm in the process of editing it down to something that would be book length because since he did try to write every day and it was often multiple pages, I think there were over 2,000 separate pages and maybe 600 or so letters and it's too unwieldy, but I'm, I'm going through and hacking away with a machete so that it's of a digestible size. But I think it will give, also because he was Jewish, there's interesting insight into anti-Semitism and his response to things as he hears about them uh, being overseas. And just, and constantly asking my mom to send him salamis from St. Louis and uh, that initially arrived rotten because it was during the summer and they would be on the holds of ships for too long. And he would see the other GIs are getting salamis that were okay to eat. And he's trying to figure out, why are the salamis you're sending me rotting? And then finally getting usable salamis and talking about sharing them with the other guys and that he's going to convert them because they're all going to go home with a hankering for delicatessen food and all of that against the backdrop of uh, can't wait to get home after we get rid of the Nazis and then worrying that he was going to be sent to the Pacific, which I hadn't realized. Um, I always thought that the ones sent to fight the Nazis fought the Nazis and came home and the ones that went to get the Japs did that and came home. But because the war in Europe ended months before the one in Japan, Mm. they were beginning to take people back to the States for a brief furlough and then send them off to the Pacific. And Dad really didn't want to go fight another war. And it really was the A-bomb that prevented the loss of untold allies who would have had to fight a land war in Japan. But anyway, that's what I'm in the midst of is... And, and it really feels like I'm right there with him because it's such a, it's such a um, microscopic view of GI life in the 40s because they wrote so often you would get, you know, well, I expect to go here tomorrow and see this. Well, I went there and this is what happened and the Jeep broke down and I ended up with it. Um, so that's what I'm working on as I'm waiting for more things to happen with the movie. That's wonderful. I hope well, all of that comes to fruition. It sounds like you Thanks. got some great stories there. Uh, real quick, do you, do you still talk to Cabot? Yes, I do. He, uh, <laughs> he medium recently moved to Connecticut with his wife, Martha, and is kind of semi-retired, but we still t- stay in touch and email and uh, haven't seen each other in a while, but yeah, we stay in touch. Yeah, to, to, to me, anyway, I must I must <laughs> toddle at this point in time. Yes, I want to thank you so much, Steve, for uh, coming on today and having this great conversation with all these all these great stories about Groucho. And um, please stay safe because we need thank you. you. And I hope your projects yeah. are going to be great. Thank you, and uh, good luck to you and your other endeavors as well. Thank you, sir. Have a great hey, day. Tommy. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Steve Stoliar. Ain't he a cool dude? What a nice guy and great stories about Groucho. And I was glad that I got to talk to him today. It was fantastic. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Fire, dudes.